I'm Lucy Jackson, Assistant Professor in Ancient Greek Literature. I'm Erin Lee, Head of Archive at the National Theatre. In this series of films, Erin and I will be looking at some of the Greek tragedies that have been staged at the National Theatre. Using the records held in the theatre's archive as a starting point, we'll look at the practicalities of staging an ancient Greek play in a modern theatre building. The archive is home to thousands of items, from photographs to prompt scripts, technical drawings to set models, dating all the way back to our opening night in 1963. Every production has left behind some traces of the multiple artistic choices and practical considerations that go into making a performance. By exploring these plays as staged productions, rather than as pieces of literature, we begin to see these ancient works in a new light. Going behind the scenes of the productions makes us ask fresh questions about why these plays and their myths are still relevant today. The National Theatre staged Aeschylus's Oresteia in the Olivier Auditorium in 1981. Just under 20 years later, Aeschylus was back. This canonical work consists of a trilogy of plays. The Agamemnon, where the great Greek hero returns victorious from Troy, only to be murdered by his wife, Clytemnestra. The Libation Bearers, which tells the story of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra's children, seeking vengeance against their mother for the murder. And the Eumenides, where Clytemnestra's son, Orestes, is pursued by the Furies, goddesses who punish all those who murder their kin. In 1999, a second production of this epic ancient Greek work was staged at the National Theatre, this time in the Cottesloe Theatre, now known as the Dorfman. The designer was Vicky Mortimer and the director was Katie Mitchell. This was the first of three Greek tragedies that Katie Mitchell has directed to date at the National Theatre. In her Oresteia, we can see many elements that are characteristic of her approach to theatre making. A rigorous attention to psychologically realistic acting, together with surreal or dreamlike movement, ritual acts, and a mixture of classical and folk music. The production used a new version by the poet laureate Ted Hughes and the trilogy of plays was split into two. The first and longer play, Agamemnon, was renamed The Home Guard. This is a reference to the chorus of the play, a group of old men left behind during the Trojan War. The second and third plays of Aeschylus' trilogy were made into one play named The Daughters of Darkness. This was another reference to the two choruses in the play. In the first half, a group of enslaved women, and in the second half, a group of vengeful female deities, the Furies. In this film, we'll look at some of the records held in the National Theatre's archive and see how they give us insights into the world of the play, the use of the stage space, and the way media and technology were used for dramatic effect. The world of the play that this production conjured was far from antique. In every respect, the action of the play took place in the modern world, although the team deliberately avoided specifying a precise time period or geographical location. Audiences were offered a range of references to people and events in 20th century history. The First and Second World Wars are alluded to by the poppies worn by the chorus in the first play, and indeed in its very title, The Home Guard. Clytemnestra's blonde hair and demure floral dress had some reviewers comparing her with the mid-20th century Argentinian politician Eva Perón. The evidence bags and incidental items photographed and featured in the programme recall the exhaustive and meticulous trials for war crimes at the European Court of Human Rights, an organisation made permanent in 1998, just a year before this production opened. The Chorus of Furies are furnished with the kind of medicalised torture implements that were used in the Bosnian War in the 1990s. All these references worked to underline the relevance of Aeschylus' play, even two and a half thousand years after its first performance in 458 BCE. Concerns articulated by Aeschylus for his ancient Greek audience about vengeance, civil war, the pursuit of justice, and the possibility of reconciliation were shown in this version of the Oresteia to be not so ancient, but tragically and horrifyingly present in our own very recent history.
We should never underestimate how a different theatre space can completely change how a play is crafted, experienced and archived. Katie Mitchell's Oresteia played in what was then called the Cottesloe, now known as the Dorfman Theatre. Unlike the Olivier and Littleton spaces, the Cottesloe was a flexible, studio-style space which could be configured in multiple different ways, a bit like a black box theatre space. This Oresteia was staged in traverse, with the audience seated on two sides of a long central stage space at floor level. There were two large screens at each end and over six different places where actors could enter and exit. This arrangement of the auditorium brought the audience much closer to the action of the play. In fact, there is more than one stage management report noting that audience members were splashed with stage blood or wine. They were that close to the violent and messy events of the play. This intimacy is something that would have been impossible in a huge and open-air ancient Greek theatre. The action of the play in all Greek tragedies takes place outside, in front of a palace or a temple or in an army encampment. In Katie Mitchell's Oresteia, we are in a space that is nominally in front of the palace. We hear about security lights and deliberately loud clanging doors in the stage notes. But the audience is brought inside that palace. Dining tables are wheeled on and off. We witness a brief dance between lovers before dinner, or we see guests seated and sharing a meal. The divide between inside and outside space is blurred. Bringing the audience into the domestic space, as opposed to maintaining the action in a public and outdoor place, makes the play a lot more immediate, relatable and modern. The production was no less poetic, but it was more domestic than we might expect in a Greek tragedy. This domestication of Greek tragedy has become dominant in how contemporary theatre makers approach the genre. Nowadays, we see more Greek tragedies taking place in the living rooms of well-off middle-class families than in austere and sumptuous royal palaces. Katie Mitchell's Oresteia was ahead of the curve in giving audiences an early example of this kind of domestication. The configuration of the stage and audience is something that we have to grapple with when it comes to looking at the archive materials too. The digital recording is made from one end of the auditorium and much of the action is happening outside of the camera's frame. We get a really good view of the chorus in the first half of Daughters of Darkness, but barely catch a glimpse of the Furies in the second half. More recent productions that are filmed for NT Live, NT at Home or for the Archive capture multiple angles. But for this Oresteia, we have an obviously partial record of the performance. This makes the prompt script and any photographs even more important for filling in some of the action invisible from the production recording. Aeschylus was no stranger to using the latest technology for dramatic effect. We think that the Oresteia was the first ancient Greek play to use a stage building that could support the weight of an actor as opposed to just being a screen at the back of the main stage space. This building, the Skerne, is crucial to the Oresteia's stage action. When the watchman delivers his opening speech, perhaps for the first time in theatre, he does so from above the stage, on the roof of that building. Katie Mitchell's Oresteia, in a similar way, created powerful dramatic effects in its use of what was, in the late 90s, recent technology, the digital camera. These cameras were used on stage, sometimes set in fixed places and sometimes held by actors. The live feed from these cameras was then projected onto the two large screens at either end of the stage space, meaning that the audience's attention could be focused on a particular face or on particular words or particular visuals like a map or a page in a book. Using this digital technology also invited the audience to think about the use of media in our own world. What lies beyond the frame that we're being shown? We are encouraged to look where the camera is pointing us, but in live theatre, we can also see who is behind the camera and what else is going on, and perhaps what we're being distracted from. The use of cameras on stage added to the aesthetic experience of the play. 
But they also introduce a wholly modern concern. The potential for media to be manipulated by those in power and to manipulate us in the audience. The stage management reports made after each show give us some insight into the challenges involved with using this technology on stage. Fixed cameras get accidentally dislodged by actors and in one performance they had to freeze while they reset it. Even the more old-fashioned technology, the tape players held by some members of the chorus, could malfunction. One of these handheld machines chewed up the tape ribbon in the middle of a performance. This not only disrupted the show, but also meant a new recording had to be made. It is less unusual nowadays for cameras to be used on stage, but we should recognise how Katie Mitchell was at the forefront of this technique. It is even more interesting to see how this thoroughly modern technology was deployed in one of our most ancient dramatic works. The National Theatre Archive really is a unique resource that allows you to get up close to all these incredible productions and unlock interpretations of classic texts that perhaps you'd never considered before. Anyone can book a time to access the resources of the National Theatre's archive by contacting us via our website.